welcome to my talk. I'm very pleased to uh, kick off the defense track here at the AppSec in Amsterdam. That's very nice. And I'm really excited to talk about high security settings with CRS. I think it is the first time CRS in high security environments has ever been presented at a conference. So this is really cool. Uh, uh, who am I? I'm the author of the second edition of the Mod Security Handbook, so I know a wee bit about mod security. And I'm also co-lead of the Always Mod Security Call Rules Set project, obviously the project with the longest name within OWASP. <laughs> Good. We could dive straight into the topic for today, but I fear we would leave some of the audience behind. So a couple of project members more situated in that field. Hi, guys. <laughs> so this is going to be a bit boring for you, uh, for all the mod security enthusiasts, but I want to bring everybody on the same page, have everybody in the boat when we really start to get serious about the high security here. So I'm going to explain a few things first. Uh, let me start with what is a web application firewall. Leaning on Wikipedia, I'm defining a WAF as a device that is monitoring, filtering, and blocking web traffic to the application and back to the client. The back part is also important. By inspecting HTTP traffic, the WAF is able to protect backend applications from security misconfigurations, but namely cross-site scripting, all sorts of injections, local file inclusions, remote command execution, you name it. A ton of security risks defined, for example, in the OWASP TOL 10, mod security CRS helps you with that protection. So mod security is an engine that implements these features for you. Traditionally, coupled with Apache, it is the only open source web application firewall aimed at general HTTP. So there are a lot of specific, language specific, application specific, WAF offerings around their open source. But if you want to protect your complete enterprise, there is only mod security in the open source domain that helps you with that task. And there are now alternatives to run here. That is true. Uh, mod security runs within Fastly. We've heard yesterday, we did a CRS community summit yesterday. So we talked about CRS a lot yesterday already. We've heard that Varnish is about to release uh, an offering to run mod security rules within the product. Azure is trying to do a very good job running mod security on their platform natively. Verizon has re-implemented mod security rule language in a product or a software called Waffles. That is kind of open source, but not quite uh, the latest version. So this is getting mod, uh, much more diverse now. There are alternative options coming up. And additionally, a lot of commercial vendors have either integrated mod security, they have forked mod security, or they have re-implemented the rule language of mod security so they could run rules, mod security rules, within their service, product, appliance, or offerings, however you want to name it. So not all these commercial vendors, or like most of these commercial vendors, are actually not advertising this fact that they have a bright and shiny product, but under the hood, it's actually mod security. Uh, and when you inspect this more closely, then you realize that these vendors did this in order to run the call rule set. So you could say the main reason for people to run mod security is actually being able to run the call rule set. And as a co-lead of the CRS project, I share this perspective. The interesting thing about mod security is CRS, not so much the engine. Good. So what is CRS? It's a good time to talk about CRS because the day before yesterday, we released CRS 3.2, major release, first major release in a year. Uh, we came to Amsterdam to celebrate this, and we had a lot of fun yesterday. So that was really cool. 
CRS is the standard mod security rule set. That is what people are running when they talk about running mod security most of the time. It runs on hundreds of terabit of traffic per second globally. I've mentioned Verizon. Verizon told us yes last year they run CRS on 50 terabit across the globe. There's a huge amount of traffic being filtered by CRS. And of lot, there are, there are alternative rules set around the commercial offerings around, but CRS is the uh, rule set that we want to talk about. CRS is a generic blacklisting rule set. What does generic blacklisting mean? Unlike uh, intrusion detection system that has patterns for specific attacks, a known exploit covered in a CVE gets a pattern and a rule that's then blocked CRS doesn't work that way. We're not blocking a known exploit. We're blocking because it smells of SQL. It's much more generic than that. So not a known SQL injection is being blocked, but a payload that has a scent of SQL is being blocked. Say like that. This is surprisingly effective. Uh, I mean, we don't claim to be a next generation self-learning, artificial intelligence, cloud-enabled security monster. Uh, mod security in CRS is much more like a well-tuned clockwork that gives you very granular control. And this is especially important in high security settings where you want to have total control, total monitoring capabilities over the traffic going into your application and going out of the application. Uh, so even if we don't have the resources of the commercial vendors, the commercial products, some of them integrating CRS, some of them doing rules on their own, we're doing quite good. And uh, it's a very popular project, uh, and it's very well suited to the task ahead. Here is a graph that I did uh, two years ago, and it shows you a pumped-up burp attacking a vulnerable application. So we have an application with lots of known vulnerabilities meant to, to find out just how many of those vulnerabilities will Burp be able to detect or discover. Burp executed four and a half million requests against this single application. And with over a thousand requests in the first column, Burp would say, look, I think I hit the weakness there. That is not a thousand weaknesses. It boils down to 40 different vulnerabilities. Now in the second column, that is the five minute default installation of CRS. When doing the default installation, local fine inclusions no longer possible. Almost total protection there. Cross-site scripting greatly diminished. SQL injection gone. Now SQL injection isn't gone completely. A dedicated and smart attacker is still able to pull off an SQL injection. But the difference is now that Burp is no longer being any assistance here. You have to do this by hand, and you have to be really smart about this and know how SQL works to be able to work your way around CRS, even in a default installation. So the default installation uh, gives you very good coverage already. Um, of course, in a high security setup, you're probably ready to invest more than five minutes into default installation. Then default installation. This is where the additional three columns come into play. We call this the higher paranoia levels. So you have a default paranoia level uh, in the second column in the default installation. That's paranoia level one. Uh, and this brings you 150 rules. These rules are very well tested. They're quite good, are really good at detecting malicious traffic, by at detecting attackers. And they have a characteristic of never or almost never touching vanilla traffic. So you're paying customers, they're almost usually, they're not affected by these 150 standard or default rules. Uh, so... They, these default rules make a very good distinction between the benign users and the attackers on the other hand. That is very important. Now, sometimes it may happen that a benign user is still affected. 
So that would be a false alert, a so-called false positive. The user is stopped by executing his transaction or her transaction uh, by a rule that does an error. We want to get rid of these false alerts. If you happen to bump into such a problem in the default installation, please report it on our GitHub. And we try to update the rule so this doesn't happen. The idea is you get a smooth installation, a good experience, installing it, application continues to run without any hassle. In reality, we have to admit sometimes you get problems, but we're ready there to help you with that. Good. So a smart attacker, if she's really smart, she's able to work around the default installation. We need additional rules to catch these attackers. And these rules come into the higher paranoia levels. We start out with 150 and we grow to 200 rules when we raise the paranoia level to 4. So you get 30 additional rules at 2, another 15 at 3, and another 5 or 10 at paranoia level 4, totaling uh, 200 rules. Now, the situation afterwards is going to be like a dog protecting your house. At a paranoia level 1, you have a very sensitive, nice uh, pet dog. At paranoia level 4, you really get a mad dog here. And for an attacker, for a burglar attacking your house in the night, it's really hard to get around a mad dog. It's a really dangerous dog here. Unfortunately, it also has the unwanted side effect of biting your guests from time to time. You could say that is a side effect of keeping a mad dog or running a higher paranoia level for that matter. Uh, a dog biting your visitors, that is a false positive. The mailman delivering a post parcel or package to your house, being bitten by your dog, that is a false positive. And in order to run this successfully, you have to get rid of the false positive. You need to instruct your dog, you have to train your dog to no longer attack your guests. That is a tuning process. And that is, can be very time consuming. At paranoia level one, you have a sensitive dog. It will hardly ever bite anybody. Paranoia level two dogs, now they tend to be a bit mad. And especially if it's a new mailman or the mailman has yummy legs, <laughs> might bite him. Paranoia level three, now it's really aggressive. And at paranoia level four, without prior training, the mailman will be torn into pieces. Unless you train your dog to refrain from all unwanted carnage here. So the higher you go with paranoia levels, the more false positives you get, and the more resources, more time you need to invest to tune them away. This is just a time return on investment thing here. To return to the dog metaphor, you have to instruct the dog to leave the mailman alone. That is possible. The dog generally responds well to training. Uh, it follows the instructions and this can be done. And afterwards, the mailman can deliver the package without any problem. But it is certainly a good idea to tell the mailman to come to the front door alone and not trying out the back door of the house. <laughs> because the dog is still very mad. Good. That was the basic concept of paranoia levels. Did you get that? Did I get this across? Good. Uh, CRS people, now comes the serious part of the talk. High security setups. Uh, I don't have a clear cut definition of a high security setup. Let me use the following one. A high security setup is a setup where you're willing and able to invest a lot of time developing and refining configuration to optimize it for security. So I define it as a time investment. If you want to have high security, you need more resources, more time. You need to go to a project manager and tell give me more days to tune this to be really high security. Now, what you're actually doing, uh, that's up to you. I'm talking about CRS here. Uh, of course, the high security setting will be more than only the WAF, and the WAF might be more than only CRS. I'm touching on that topic as well. But first, uh, let's concentrate on CRS. Uh, I've done several high security uh, setups in my life. The most interesting one 
has been an online voting site in Switzerland. Uh, if you follow the news, namely in Switzerland, you've probably heard a lot of really bad media coverage for the Swiss. Uh, you did, Ralph, didn't you? <laughs> Definitely a lot of bad coverage for the Swiss Post online voting system. Uh, a lot of the talk is based on that. The setup is well published uh, in government reports, audits, and articles, which I'm going to show you at the end, uh, the resources. So what I'm talking about here is already published, but this talk allows you to connect the dots and make the correct interpretation of these government re reports and understanding what they are actually writing. You know this... Reports can be a bit cryptic sometimes when they come from the government. <laughs> so what did happen? Why did they get so much bad news? There was a transparency effort with the online voting system, rightly so, but they would publish the source code in one program and run a public intrusion test or a bug bounty program in a second program. And the source code program immediately got a lot of criticism. The source code was torn apart. And the project had to shut down and go into recess for over a year to repair the source code because it's just not re really usable. It's not secure at all, as they found out after two weeks after the source code publication. Well, the Spanish developers doing that source code said, no, everything is fine. And no, not, nothing was fine with that source code, it seems. However, the second, the bug bounty program made far less news or headlines, uh, because there were 900 attackers, many of them recruited at DEF CON in the e-voting village. You would assume these are the specialists. These are the e-voting guys. They know how to tear apart an online voting application. Uh, and they actually found vulnerabilities, uh, 16 of them. So 900 attackers, four weeks, 16 findings. The highest severity was low. How does the two things come together? You have a broken source code, lots of weaknesses, and attackers not being able to exploit them. So there's a huge contrast. And this went as far as people wouldn't believe that the bug bounty program was for real. Is this a publicity stunt? That's, that's not how this works. If you have broken source code, you're ripped apart in the actual installation. But no, we were able to protect the application despite having a lot of security issues thanks to a very high security setup in front of the application. And this is what I'm talking about here. Good. Um, here I'm documenting uh, two or three of the findings. Uh, uh, the first one, uh, just quoting that, that's really a nice one. So they found a hole by connecting in clear text to the web server. In clear text, on port 443. The web server was surprisingly nice enough to respond with a clear text message on the encrypted port. And the response would include a strict transport security header. Nope, I don't think you know about this, but actually that's what Apache can do if you configure it a, a wee bit wrong. And the RFC says you shouldn't transmit the strict transport security header over clear-cut connections. Uh, so... Uh, that is a violation of the best practice within the RFC. There's no security <laughs> effect whatsoever because the 400 bad request response and strict transport security doesn't really apply here, whatever, but Swiss Post pay 200 Swiss francs. Okay. okay, we accept that's a best practice violation. That's a low or info security finding. 200 Swiss francs go away. Uh, the highest uh, findings we had was an IP injection into a log file. So an attacker was able to inject an IP address, only an IP address, into a log file uh, that wasn't actually there. So that was the highest uh, finding they had. Good. Base platform. So what do you want to do on the base platform? I talked about alternatives to run mod security nowadays. What we are used here and what I advise my customers still, you want to run mod security 2.9 on Apache 2.4. It's the best platform to the for the task they had, namely in a high security setup. Why is that? It's a proven, stable platform or application, and it's feature complete as far as CRS is concerned. There exists Mod Security 3. It has been around for almost two years now, but it's still not feature complete. So uh, Mod Security 3 is not passing the CRS test suite. They're not blocking all the things they're supposed to block with their new engine. So that's how a lot of people 
and I are still stuck on ModSecure 2.9 because the new kid on the block, the next generation mod security, is still not passing the test suite after two years of being released. Uh, performance? Uh, surprisingly, uh, Nginx is a really fast uh, uh, reverse proxy, and mod security now runs on Nginx, uh, but as soon as you put Nginx, uh, mod security on Nginx, it gets quite bad. So uh, with mod security included, Apache takes the lead, and suddenly Apache is faster than Nginx, only because of mod security. That's because the mod security implementation, the old one, 2.9, is faster than the new one. So that is a complicated situation. If you care about performance, then Apache is surprisingly the better platform for you. Uh, Apache also gives you access to resp response bodies, and as, as we've heard in the initial definition of above, not only the request is important, but also the response is important. The request is certainly more important as far as attacks are concerned. But you cannot rule out that a stack trace going out to the client should be detected by the WAF. Uh, an SQL error message should be detected by the WAF, and Nginx doesn't give you access to the response. That is a problem, namely in high security settings. And then, of course, it is the flexibility of Apache in every dimension that makes it such a good platform. Uh, I'm a lot into logging. A standard web server logs the request line, the user agent, and the referrer of a client. Well, the IP address as well, of course. But So that's the basics. But that's far not enough for my purpose, namely in high security settings. I, I want to have the TLS protocol version. I want to see the cipher that the clients actually use. I want to see the timings of mod security. Do we have a performance problem? Do we have rules that take too much time? What requests take so long? That is really important for me. I want to see the total IO going into and going out. I want to see dozens of additional bits of information in the log file so I can run statistics and I can analyze things. I can examine things, debug the behavior of the web server. And that is an overview. Unfortunately, Nginx is not able to give you that. So Apache is much more flexible, allowing you all this insight makes it really suited for high security setups. Uh, all this is well documented in a series of tutorials. That is the logging tutorial that I've published at nvr.com. It's a series of tutorials. Uh, 12 of them, actually, uh, they exist for Apache. They also exist for Nginx, where, where Nginx actually uh, is able to pull this off. Uh, so uh, there is a link on the web server to go to the N Nginx branch, but the Apache is more refined because I'm more of an Apache specialist here. Uh, these tutorials tell you how to set this all up, how to put mod security on the top, how to put CRS on top, and how to tune away the mad dog or the false positives. Uh, they're fairly popular. We have like 5,000 unique visitors per month. So you could say these are really the de facto standard tutorials to run CRS or mod security in production. Anomaly scoring. CRS has a mechanism called anomaly scoring. That is a very interesting feature. It's a game changer. In a standard WAF, in a black and white setting, you have an alert, immediate block it, blockade. Something bad happens to be in, in the request, you block immediately. And that the, the tool is very coarse, uh, in a sense, alert, blockade. With anomaly scoring, how this boils down on a technical level is, the rules are only doing the detection. The rules are not blocking themselves. They're detecting SQL injections, for example, and then they add a score that we just sum up. So the request, request passes all the rules, and at the end, we sum up the scores. And then we say, uh, this request got like 25 points, and now where is our threshold? And we can change the threshold. And that is like the appetite for alerts that we want to have. And this allows us to start in blocking mode immediately without ever blocking, which has put the threshold extremely high and no user is ever going that high, and then we see what happens. And then we tune away the false positives and bring down the anomaly threshold or limit to more and more reasonable levels. I typically start out with 10,000, go down to 100, 50, 
20, 10, and 5. And at 5, I'm down to a level where a single alert leads to blockade. So the end result is black and white. Single alert being blockade. But the way to get there is much more flexible and adaptive uh, than uh, in a black and white setting. And I don't really have the time to go into details here. This is well documented in the tutorials and it is a total game changer, namely in high security setups, because in high security setups you have so many false positives. And if you block after every false positive, the testers are going crazy because they can never carry out their tests. And with that setup, you have them test, then you tune away the false positives, and it's all happening in the background. And when you reduce this threshold, you can make a very reasonable decision and saying, look, if we go to a limit of 20, nothing bad will happen because all our users are staying below 20. So that's really, really useful. In a black and white setting, you would have to stay in monitoring mode until the big day comes where you have really tuned away the false positive, and then you go from monitoring to blocking, and that day very often never comes. So you stay in monitoring mode forever, and who cares about locks when there are a lot of false positives? Nobody even watches or uh, supervises the VAF in these setups. That's very typical. Good. So what is the goal that we try to achieve here? We want to get a completely clean thing, empty like the desert. We want to tune down to zero false positives. No benign user should ever generate a false positive. That is the ultimate goal. Uh, let's say... In a standard setup, you have somebody registering at your website, and because the person lives at a funny address, it causes a false positive. Uh, address looks like an SQL injection. That was a real false positive you had in the CRS. Union Street, Union, SQL, Keyword. It happened to be false positive for a lot of people living at Union Street. Too bad. Have to tune this away. With zero false positives, you know, whatever your benign user are going to enter in your application, no false positives will happen. And that is such a liberating moment. It's an extremely rare moment in the VAF world. Because in the VAF world, whenever you see alert, you're never quite sure. Is this now a benign user? Is it an attacker? Let's examine. Let's look closer so we're really sure what happened. If you are at the zero false positive setup, if you achieve that level of assurance, then you know whenever it pops up, it is an attacker. Don't have to think twice. It is guaranteed to be an attacker. Now, how do you get there? Can you actually get is, is this for real? Or is this more like a quality death march with the goal on the horizon and you never get there? No, you can get to, air, to zero false positive, but I admit it's a lot of work. The Swiss Post e-voting system is in a state of zero false positives. So two years of constant use uh, led to zero false positives. So no voter using the online voting system bumped into a false positive. That is a very good state to be in because we know we only have attackers in the logs. That is so liberating. Uh, in my experience, complex applications and a lot of free text input that's the problem with false positives. More modern applications designed or created with the help of modern frameworks are much more structured very often. So in the absence of freeform input, uh, you have false positives, maybe a, even a big number of false positives, but the variety, the variety is very small. It's the same ones all over the place because the framework caused this false positive by doing things in a certain way. You tune it away and whoosh, they're gone. So modern applications are much easier to tune, and I think that's very good news. It's the written by hand old HTML applications, funny variable names, funny requests uh, done by hand that cause a lot of different false positive in different parts of the application. Modern ones are much easier to tune. Good. Uh, forgot one thing. So what means zero false positive? 
I think, or I would counsel you or advise you to get into a region of one false positive in 10,000 requests. I think that is the goal you want to achieve. 10 million, did I say 10,000? Sorry. I meant 10 million. One request in 10 million giving you a false alert. That is close enough to zero, close enough to be on the safe side. Because in one bad request in 10 millions, you probably have a more backend failures, more bad gateway 502 error messages in the browsers than false positives because, because of the WAF. The WAF is no longer your biggest concern here. Backend stability is the bigger problem usually. So one in 10 millions is usually good. Obviously, you need vast amount of traffic to get there. A small B2B application with 10 logins per week will never get to 10 million requests. So you need a lot of testing, a lot of production traffic to be able to gauge this and, and get to this level. But it can be done if you're really able to invest the time. And in a high security setting, obviously, money is graciously often less of an issue than in a standard IT project. When you want to achieve a high security Management is aware this is going to cost money. And they say, look, we need so much testing. Without that, we cannot get there. And people bump into false positive production uh, problems, and then they realize, oh, yeah, the guys told us to do more testing. And we actually have the money. We just have to invest it. So high security setting, they tend to uh, be able to test this. So truly, one false positive in 10 million is where you want to go. That is close enough to zero a liberating moment. And when you are there, you can really start to divide and rule because right now you have a clear cut, good users in that side of the room, the attackers on the other side. No, that was only a joke. <laughs> but you can tell the two apart now because every alert points to an attacker. And if that is established, you can become really nasty with the attackers. Because before that, you would uh, go, is it really an attack? And now you can say, no, it's definitely an attack. I already know that. And you're now not only blocking the request. No, you can ban the IP address immediately because it's a known attacker. Why would you continue to talk to such a client when you know it is an attacker? You ban the IP address immediately. The tool to pull this off usually is fail to ban on a Unix system. Uh, if this uh, has you tremble in fear, fail to ban is a dangerous tool. Uh, pulling this off uh, is difficult. It's very easy to cut off your toes with fail to ban. So you need to know what you're doing here. And depending on the situation where you have users sharing IP addresses, netting in place, or uh, vanilla users sitting at star Starbucks next to attackers attacking you, they would also be banned. So you need to know what you're actually doing here. But depending on the situation, you can go, no, the IP address belongs to an attacker and I'm blocking the IP address and I know no standard users are using the same IP address. And if you're in that situation, you can ban it. There are still implementation problems coming with this. Depending on the setup, it actually depends a bit on the Linux distribution. How does IP ban, uh, fail to ban behave? Very often, it only blocks SYN packets. So IP SYN, establish a new uh, TCP connection, is blocked, while as an established connection continues to work. Uh, and if you know HTTP, HTTP and uh, the future QUIC platform, this is about multiplexing, HTTP keep alive, reusing TCP connection that has been established for additional requests. So if you're uh, not paying attention, then fail to ban will uh, block future new connections, but the attacker, having established a TCP connection, can channel hundreds of requests against your application and you're not even aware of it. So there are a few implementation issues here that you need to get right, but this can be overcome and you get to a situation where burp trying to scan your application is blocked after the first request. And uh, I would have can share the obvious with you Burp has a hard time exploiting replication if it's blocked after one request for like an hour, for example. That's just, why don't we block for an hour? Makes 24 requests a day for Burp or changing your IP address after every request, which is really expensive and difficult to pull off. So this brings you a lot of advancement in security. Uh, for Swiss online voting, I have to add the remark, we had to switch this off for the bug bounty program.
The government instructed Swiss Post, you switch off the fail to ban because the attackers wouldn't have a dent against you. So at least give them a fucking chance to scan you. <laughs> and at first we were a bit depressed, uh, but I understand <laughs> the feeling there. Good. So that's uh, about as far as you can go with CRS in a high security setting. If you want to raise the security even higher, you need to turn to whitelisting. Uh, CRS, as I have explained, is a blacklisting rule set. Whitelisting is the other way around. With a whitelisting rule set, you establish a wall of defense, a deny all wall against uh, the internet, and every request that hasn't been enabled specifically will be blocked. So every API endpoint that is not configured, every query string parameter that you haven't enabled in the rule set, is going to be blocked. Funny HTTP headers, interesting content types, blocked by default, because everything is blocked by default unless you enable it. Of course, this is fairly expensive. That, that is difficult to do. That takes a lot of time. Um, and we, uh, how can you do this? Uh, you have to invest time, examine the application, and establish this rule set. This is costly. However, as I said, high security setting, setups, they have the money to do this, if, if, uh, if you know how to do it. And for the not so high security setting, maybe you don't need to do this completely. Imagine an application where you have registered users, B2B sites, and for the non-authenticated user, you're only giving them the front page, the welcome page, and the login form. Now, how difficult can it be to whitelist a welcome page in the login form? It's bloody simple. It's a couple of post, it's one post request and a couple of get requests. And this reduces the attack surface tremendously because the non-authentic users can no longer attack your search form, your, uh, the, 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 the basket, whatever you have in the deeper layers of your application. They're limited to the front door and that one is very easy to protect and not very uh, cost intense and it doesn't change. And again, modern applications developed with the help of modern frameworks are much easier to do a whitelisting setup because they have functionality to export the complete API to you. All the parameters exported in the file, you transform this file into a rule set with the help of a couple of scripts. So you get an automatic, auto-generated whitelisting mod security rule set. Not for free, but at a very good cost. And you can constantly update it automatically. So that really helps. So the longer we go, it becomes easier to run whitelisting rule set. In my experience, whitelisting is very well suited for structured traffic. Well structured traffic. When you have free form input, free text fields, online mail, for example, Oracle database administrators exchanging SQL queries via mail. That's very hard to protect with whitelisting. <laughs> but their free text forms are better suited with a blacklisting approach like CRS. Structured application, structured input, very helpful to protect with whitelisting. The two combine make a high security setup. So my advice is to combine the two to stack it up above each other. What are additional rule sets worth considering in such situations? Uh, you can do, uh, you can monitor the natural flow of an application. So if somebody requests, uh, places a request that is in the wrong order, I mean, why do you want to check out when you haven't even selected something that doesn't work? That, that is suspicious. Uh, if there are requests that look more like a vulnerability scanner, you, you block them immediately. Rules like, like that can be done. Users and browsers have a certain rhythm and timing how they request uh, resources in your application. Vulnerability scanners and pen testers have, or attackers have a completely different timing and, and rhythm. And it should be easy to tell the two apart by calculating this a bit. I haven't seen this done in mod security, but really love to see such a rule set or have a customer ask me to develop that. That would be really good fun. Uh, and you can also do a client fingerprinting. Uh, the, uh, the, um, 
understanding the the client or the family of a client of the user agent nowadays is not so easy anymore. I mean, the user agent is now so complicated, but there are libraries to do this for you. Or you do JavaScript where you uh, fingerprint the client and then you really identify Firefox. We have a Q&A as well, don't we? Yeah. Well, actually, <laughs> more or less. <laughs> what, what is the timing? It's 11. Oh, it's 11. We, let, we started later than we wanted to. Okay, okay. I'm mean, really quick. Okay, I'm almost done. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, client fingerprinting, pull your stuff together, and then if it says it is a Firefox, but it doesn't do requests that Firefox would do, then you know it is an attacker again. You can block it immediately. Uh, outside of mod security, you need to have application denial of service defense on the WAF, Quality of service to protect against scraping is important. GOIP can be a big help and look into DNS blacklisting or blacklisting DNS because you don't want to talk to known offenders. And blacklisting DNS tells you, look, this IP address is bad. Why don't you talk? Why don't you stop talking to the IP address? All combined, CRS paranoia level four, whitelisting rule set, couple of additional measures give you a high security WAF setting. And that will be the summary of my talk. Resources here, don't need to write this down. I'm going to publish the slides. These are the key reports about the Swiss Post e-voting system, tutorial URL on top. And if you're intrigued by mod security or want to learn more about CRS, I'm running uh, two uh, public courses, uh, one at the end of October in Zurich and one at the end of November in London will be Pleased to see some of the faces back in my courses. Thank you for attending my talk.